Good morning, St. Paul. I love that. I heard that with my deaf ear. Um, okay, so we do have a few announcements for you this morning. The first one being that because it's Thanksgiving, we're not going to have any of our small groups, any of our Bible studies, or our Wednesday night picnic. We will not have that this week. Um, also, we want to let all of our youth know that are out there that we're having a spy giving instead of a friends giving. We're going to have a spy giving on Tuesday from 6 to 8. Um, we're going to just decorate the youth building a little bit, hang out, play some nine square, um, and just have a big meal together. And so if y'all are in town for this Thanksgiving, we really um, encourage y'all to come out and hang out with us. Also, we have our Messengers of Love, which is only, I think, two or three weeks away now. And if you do not know what this is, Messengers of Love, they deliver poinsettias to those that are confined to their home due to an illness of any sort, um, or it's someone that, is potential, that has lost someone in their family in the last year. And so if you'd like to be um, part of this ministry and delivering poinsettias on December 6th, please be sure to contact Ms. Grace Bailey. Um, also, our real women's ministry is, will be meeting on December 3rd. They will start off the Advent season um, making Christmas wreaths with fresh greenery. Um, we ask that you provide the greenery and we will provide the snacks. Uh, the cost for is $25 and we'll meet in the fellowship hall at 6.30 on a Thursday. Just be sure, once again, you RSVP to Grace Bailey. Lastly, uh, Winton Neighborhood Network uh, I, I always needs donations during this time of the year for Thanksgiving and for Christmas. St. Paul usually is the donating month for the month of December. So as y'all do your shopping this week for Thanksgiving and leading up even to Christmas, we encourage y'all to just buy a few extra holiday items that you can donate to the network. You can um, bring them to the, uh, to the church, to the front office of the church, or you can contact Mary Lou Gerald and she can meet you and coordinate and get them for you, or you can deliver them straight to the network. Um, also, lastly, we want to be sure you know that if you look on your bulletin, there is a QR code at the bottom, and it will have all of our weekly events for you. All you have to do is just take your cell phone, open up your camera, and just scan that QR code, and click on the link that shows up on your phone, and it takes you to all of our Bible studies, any of our weekly events as a church, small groups, Sunday school classes, all of it. So you'll be in the loop about all of your events for each week. Um, at this time, oh, excuse me, I also want to acknowledge the flowers in the sanctuary altar. Today they are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Marjorie Johnson by Betty and Buddy Roberts and family. The flowers in the narthex area of the sanctuary are given to the glory of God and in celebration of the marriage of Mr. and Mrs. James Edward Norris V, January, November 21st, 2020. The rose bed in the Chancellor area of the sanctuary is in honor of David, um, Thomas Watkins, Watkins, excuse me, born November 9th, 2020, to Thomas and Sally Varner Watkins, big sister to Mims and Eliza Chance, welcome him to the family, and proud grandparents of David and Mary Varner and Julie. <laughs> what Shane said, Dem Dempsey, excuse me, and Steve Watkins. At this time, um, I invite you all to, to join us in worship. Um, we invite you to follow along with our hymn of contemplation for the beauty of the earth, which is number 92.
I invite you to stand for the, I'm sorry y'all, I'm struggling a little bit. Um, I invite you to stand and join me in the historic confession of the Christian church as well as the New Testament scripture reading. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You may be seated. I invite you now to bow your heads and join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your creation. We thank you for the sun. We thank you for this time and this season that we get to go through. Lord, and I pray that as we head into this Thanksgiving week and as we lead into the Christmas season, I pray that we will use this as a time to reflect, a time to reflect and to remember you. Remember your faithfulness. Remember your love for us. Remember your kindness, your grace, and your mercy. And Lord, I know that at times it's really easy for us to get fixated on the negative, on the struggles, on the things that we're dealing with on a daily basis. And it's very hard to see the good sometimes. But Lord, I pray that you will motivate us, that you will give us that strength to stop for a minute and remember who you are. And remember that you are who you say you are and that your promises are true and you're going to do what you say you will do. And Lord, I ask that we will stop and reflect in a way that we can see all the ways that you have pulled us through, all the ways that you have guided us, all the ways that you have provided for us, all the ways that you have protected us. And Lord, I, I ask that you will help us to be mindful of the words that you once taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn of contemplation is Now Thank We All Our God, number 102. <laughs>
It is good to uh, see you this morning. I want to invite you, if you would, to please bow your heads and let us pray together. Oh God, now as we move to a different part of worship, one where we want to engage the Scripture lesson, what we pray, oh God, is that your Spirit would be present in a way that it would take what was read and heard and at the same time leverage it in a way so that what's created inside of us is the nature of Christ. If in this process, O oh God, of us growing more and more like you, we pray, God, that if there are things inside of us that need to change or to cease, then so be it, O oh God. If there are things that need to increase, then we pray for that as well. In the end, O oh Lord, what we pray, God, is that your nature would reign supreme inside of us. And we pray this now in the name of Christ. Amen. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Now, I have to tell you, every time I read this passage, there's, there's part of me that is perplexed because in the Scripture lesson, there are three imperatives, uh, to do, to pray, to, to rejoice, to give thanks, and Paul gives these, all three of these, in this shotgun format. Just do it, do it, do it. And to some degree, it's not like other past, other, oh. we're adding, hang on, Let's see if we can get it right. There we go. So Ken, if you'll just do this about every five minutes, uh, I see my friend Brad, when Brad starts to doze off, you know, that's the cue to kick it up a notch or two. See, with the, the online version, we can sort of edit certain things in there. We have to, this, this we have to do in live format. So. But normally when you read something of Paul, say in Paul's epistles, his other writings, he will give you an imperative, and out of that comes uh, maybe five, six, seven, maybe ten verses of commentary. He and other, other parts of the Bible would say, uh, rejoice. And then he sort of goes off on a, on a rabbit trail and gives you all this theology and all this commentary about what it means to rejoice. But in this passage, there's none of that. There's just simply these three imperatives, rejoice, pray, give thanks. And so when I read this, there's sometimes uh, I'm longing for some commentary because this sounds uh, almost like hyperbole where there's this, this exaggeration that uh, you're to be this way all the time, regardless of circumstances. And so maybe Paul is doing something where it's a do as I say, not so much as I do. But what we do know about Paul was that this was not hyperbole, that this actually was his, his style of life. Paul, uh, his circumstances were, were often not what we would call beneficial so that it would lead somebody to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, or give thanks and all thanks. He was in prison, in and out of prison, multiple times for the gospel, was beaten a handful of times, shipwrecked. I mean, there's all these things in his life that if we just looked at his resume, we would say, well, this is definitely a life that you shouldn't rejoice. Uh, maybe there are times where you didn't pray because you couldn't. And to give thanks for a life like this, not so much. But yet Paul did. And so the question before us today is not, is this possible? As much as it is, how is it possible? And the key lies with withholding all three of these imperatives together. If you can imagine something like a three-legged stool where one leg would be rejoice, the other leg would be pray, and then the final leg would be give thanks. In a three-legged stool, if you remove any, any leg from the three, then it topples over. Same is true with our Scripture lesson. The first leg, rejoice always. This has more to do with an inward state of being than anything else. An inward state of being that then determines your vision and how you see the world, which ultimately, ultimately affects how you act, how you behave, how you function. And for Paul, he lived in a constant state of joy because for him, with the coming of Christ, death and resurrection, 
The kingdom of God has superimposed itself over all of his life. That it's here now and at the same time it's coming in fruition. And so he approached every circumstance in his life with it's only a matter of time before things would change. About 30 years ago, I was, uh, used to love to play a lot of basketball. And if there was a pickup game going on in the community, I would play. It was uh, Back then, I'm not sure if we do it so much today inside of the church world, but about 30 years ago, the, the church basketball league was fairly robust. And I would play often in, in, uh, with different churches because uh, I love to play uh, more than anything else. Now, I stopped playing basketball because I had two realizations in my life. The first one is that the NBA was not going to call me. It didn't matter how much I practiced. I was never going to get a call by a scout. And so I hung up those dreams early. And at the same time, and this is really the reason why I stopped playing, is because I figured out that there's something that lies dormant inside of me that is tied to competition, that there was something about a church basketball league that it would rear its ugly head inside of me, and often the behavior definitely was not something that I would be proud of. Imagine that you could get in arguments, almost even fights, at a church basketball league, but I'm here to tell you that you can, or at least you could. Now, when we played, we, uh, we had about maybe six or seven players on our team. There were five of us that, that played, did most of the playing, and, and uh, of, of the four of the five starters, and me being one of them, we were maybe a B-plus player at best. But we had one player that was fantastic. And by far the best player on the court, his name was Mike. And what made Mike the best player was not that he was the fastest. Actually, he was probably average with speed. It's not that he could jump the highest. His dribbling skills were pretty good. But what made him so good and a standout compared to all the others is the guy could shoot. He had a deft touch, a pure shooter. It didn't matter if he was three or four steps this side of the half-court line or two feet under the goal. He was a gamer, and he found a way to always get the ball inside the basket. And because of him, the, the years that I played, most of the time we either won the league or we at least would make it to the finals. And there was this one year that we were at what I considered hands down better than the other team we were playing in the finals. But we had a problem. We knew that the day that we were supposed to play the last game, the final game, that Mike was going to be late. He had a conflict uh, from work, and we knew that he was going to make it to the game at some point. And so it was just, we knew that if he, if he made it to the game, we were going to win. So just a matter of time. But there was this time where we were going to start the game, and he would not be there, and we were, we were behind. And that's exactly what happened. Tip, not long after tip-off, we fell behind. And, and, and it, thankfully, he arrived at the gymnasium about midway through the, the first half, and we were down by about 10 or 12 points. And it took us about the midway through the second half for us to, to actually catch up and eventually pass, and we ended up winning by about 10 points that night. What we realized is that it was only a matter of time once Mike made it to the game. That's how Paul approached his life. It didn't matter about his circumstances because he knew that it was only a matter of time. And granted, if you were to just take his life and look at it from the first half, he would be down by 10 points. But Paul lived knowing that even though he might be behind at halftime, the game was already won because of Christ. In life, you're going to have circumstances that are a lot like shadows. But have you ever noticed that when you face the sun, the shadows are behind you, not in front of you? And for Paul and for us, you actually can rejoice always, independent of your circumstances. Because of Christ, it's only a matter of time. And then the second leg, pray without ceasing. For Paul, there existed, and the same is true for us, there's this bond of faith that creates a spiritual connection with God so that everything that you do in life actually is a form of worship. 
It doesn't matter if you're in this sanctuary worshiping. It doesn't matter if you're at home or at work or at play or whatever it may be. Because of this bond of faith, everything that you do is worship. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 12. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your what? Proper worship. And so Paul lived with this reality of the resurrection. And it was a constant and continual reminder that Christ was in him and that he was in Christ. Same reminder for us, that you are in Christ and Christ is in you. And so everything that you do stems from that connection that you have with him. So that your entire life is worship. Carl Rayner, Catholic theologian, would go so far even to say it's not just that your life is worship. Your everyday life must become itself a life of prayer. Granted, there are going to be times where it's active prayer, similar to what we did a few moments ago when we prayed together. But then passive prayer, where you're reflecting maybe on God's love or just living your life out of that connection that exists. I think everybody in this room knows that I have two children, and they're both in college. And so we've reached the stage in our life where, where they don't need our constant care or really our constant attention. And there are actually long periods of time that we might go where we don't see each other. But just because we don't see them or they don't see us doesn't mean that there's still not a deep connection. And out of that connection, sometimes there's going to be direct interaction And then sometimes there's going to be indirect interaction. But the longer we're in the relationship, which means each day that we exist, that relationship actually grows stronger. That's what pray without ceasing really is. Because you're connected to Christ, and there's this unshakable bond that exists because of that, then your entire life is a life of worship and a life of prayer. And then the last leg, to give thanks always. If my life is tied to Christ, if your life is tied to Christ, and every day is worship, then the natural yield is gratitude. And gratitude is, governs everything. And the longer we live with that connection, the more we express our gratitude, actually it changes our perspective so that we continually see things differently. A few weeks ago uh, in another sermon, I mentioned to you that I, I really, over the last probably three or four months, I've come to this conclusion. I think the average person inside the church, we totally underestimate the power of God's grace. Often we think of God's grace strictly in terms of forgiveness, as is, as is forgiveness of sins. Now, I'm, I'm thankful for that. But grace actually encompasses something far greater than we ever can imagine. It is what creates and holds that bond of faith together so that it's unshakable regardless of the circumstances, which is what led James Russell Lowell, the poet, to write this, truth forever on the scaffold, wrongs forever on the throne, but that scaffold sways the future and beyond the dim unknown, standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above God's own. What keeps God at watch What keeps God connected to us is his grace. This isn't to deny that there's not going to be pain or sorrow in life. I want you to listen listen on this. If you choose to love someone, the outcomes can be either something of bliss and happiness or the outcome can be pain and sorrow. Because you choose to love, those are the possible outcomes. 
So we're not spared pain or spared sorrow. But for those that are in Christ, there's something on the inside that guides everything that you do. And it transcends any circumstance. So that if you find yourself in the time where your, where your circumstances are pain and sorrow, there exists something inside that rises above so that you can express gratitude in all things. I think C.S. Lewis, Lewis said it best when he said, I think all Christians would agree with me if I said that though Christianity seems at first to be all about morality, all about duties, rules, guilt, virtue, yet it leads you on out of all that into something beyond where one has a glimpse of a country where they do not talk of those things except perhaps as a joke because everyone there is full with what we should call goodness as a mirror is filled with light. But even then they do not call it goodness They do not call it anything. They are not thinking of it. They are too busy looking at the source from which it comes. But this is near the stage where the road passes over the rim of our world into something greater and beyond. Because people in that country, they live with joy, regardless of circumstances. They pray always as if it is the very air that they breathe. And they're grateful as a way of life. Because you are a follower of Christ, you live in that country. So it's not a possibility. It's a reality for us. You can live where you rejoice always. You can pray without ceasing, and you can, because of your nature, give thanks in all things. So may Paul understood something, something about life that's tied to Christ that we need to reclaim again. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all things. Let us pray. Oh God, as we hold the, this three-legged stool together with these imperatives where you, where you describe our life or what it can be in Christ. So work your work of your spirit, of your grace and mercy inside of our souls that creates a vision where what we see is your kingdom everywhere and how that's superimposed on all things. And then allow these imperatives to be our life, God. This we humbly ask and we pray it now in the name of Christ. Amen. Oh,
sin-sick soul. If you can preach like Peter, if you can preach like Paul, go home and tell your neighbor he died to save us all. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sins. ask the ushers to come forward they'll uh, come to their stations and then they will after the benediction uh, cue us as we uh, leave our sanctuary receive this benediction now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ever ask or imagine to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and forever amen you are dismissed.